Welcome to everyone. My name is Erica Rob Larkins, and I'm the director of the Boehner Steeple Center for Brazilian Studies. And we're so pleased um, to host this virtual book launch for the fantastic new volume, Precarious Democracy, Ethnographies of Hope, Despair, and Resistance in Brazil, which is just out um, from Rutgers. Before we start, um, I want to thank our co-sponsor in this event, uh, the US Network for Democracy in Brazil. I also wanted to say a word on format uh, and logistics. So each of our authors is going to speak for about seven to 10 minutes, um, after which we'll have an open um, Q&A. So we ask that you please hold your questions until the end after everyone has, has spoken. And at that time, enter them into the chat via the chat button at the bottom. I know we're all really good at this by now, so you know exactly where it is. Um, so please uh, uh, you know, go ahead and enter the questions um, there for the Q&A session. I'm going to introduce now our moderator for this panel, um, Ben Young, who is a professor of anthropology at the State University of New York, New Paltz, and is currently doing a residential fellowship at the SAR. And he's going to uh, talk about the book, I think a little bit briefly, and then act as a moderator for the other authors as they talk about their chapters. So welcome, Ben, and um, I'm looking forward to this event. Thank you. Great. Uh, can you hear me okay? All sounds all right? Great. All right. Um, so uh, thank you so much, Erica, for uh, hosting this event uh, together with um, USNDB. Um, and I'm a great admirer of all of the excellent work um, be done, being done at the Boehner uh, Stiefel Center for Brazilian Studies. So it's lovely to, um, to be with you in this way. Um, before we move further, let me get my slides up here. Hopefully technology will work for us. All right, that, does that look okay? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so a, before we get into the substance, a little bit of shameless promotion. Um, if you, as you all know, we are, um, uh, we're talking about a book project, Precarious Democracy, and, you know, as you hear us speak, if you find yourself interested in getting this book, uh, we would be happy. Um, and um, uh, I believe being pasted into the chat box is more or less the same, the important uh, information here, which is that you can get it from the Rutgers University Press website. Uh, with a 30% off discode, discount if you use the code. And that'll bring the price down uh, to about 28 bucks, just under 28 bucks. So it's not a super expensive book. You can of course get it, um, uh, the PDF, uh, a virtual version. And if you're at a university, you can ask your library to buy the expensive hardback. Um, and also everyone, we will have a, um, a Portuguese version of the book uh, coming out. Uh, a versão em português está em andamento. Uh, estamos sob contrato com a editora Zuki de Porto Alegre. E o li livro de deverá estar uh, deverá ser lançado logo após o início de 2022. So it'll be coming out in early 2022 in a few months. Stay tuned for the Portuguese version. Also, uh, the final shameless promotion, um, if you, uh, where, whoever you are, wherever you are, whether you're at an academic institution or not, if you are interested in hosting an event, uh, because we're really only gonna be scratching the surface of this um, awesome book today. We, we have a lot of other authors, a lot of other themes that we get into. If you're interested and you would like to invite us, um, uh, we would, it would be our pleasure. So please get in, uh, in touch. All right. Having done that, let's move on. Um, so this is a blank slide, I know, I'm aware of that. Um, I just wanted to briefly uh, offer some other uh, thanks. Um, each of the uh, authors uh, in the book, uh, there are 16 chapters and a bunch of authors. There are four editors. I'm gonna introduce us briefly. We all have 
people and institutions who have supported, supported us during this process. And I'll leave it to my colleagues um, who are here today to thank who, who they want to thank. Um, I, for now, I want to simply thank my own institution, which is the State University of New York at New Paltz, and also the institution where I'm um, uh, lucky enough to be on a, a fellowship right now, uh, the School for Advanced Research in Santa Fe. I also want to thank our editor at Rutgers, um, who is Kimberly Guinta, um, who has honestly been uh, just great to work with. And we've, I think all of us have had a really excellent experience and with Rutgers and with Kim in particular. Uh, I also uh, just wanted to um, briefly um, uh, give uh, acknowledgement to the fellow that we dedicate the book to, who is the anthropologist John Burdick, who passed away last year um, and was a mentor to many of us, um, myself included, um, and just an extraordinary uh, anthropologist of, of Brazil, um, who was at uh, the University of Syracuse. Um, so um, we miss John. So what I'm going to do, and I think I can do it in five to seven minutes, is I'm going to briefly tell you how our book project came together. Um, and then I'm going to tell you uh, a bit about the historical context and backdrop uh, for the case studies that make up the book. And um, I'll tell you, I'll give you a quick look at the table of contents and tell you how the book is organized as well. And then we'll have um, four um, short presentations um, around 10 minutes each that are from um, the uh, other editors of the book. Um, and I'll introduce them all, but there are four editors of the English language English language version of the book, and also um, an additional editor, editor who is Karina Biondi, who is here as well, who is uh, one of the editors of the Brazilian version uh, in Portuguese that will be coming out in a few months. And we're very happy to have uh, Karina here as well. Um, and then we'll have question and answer uh, at the end. Okay, origins of the book. So first of all, who are we? Um, there are, uh, as I said, there are uh, four editors of Precarious Democracy and a, a fifth for what I imagine will be called Democracia Precaria. Um, and who are we? So we are uh, Lucia Cantero, who's an Associate Professor of International Studies at the University of San Francisco. Um, she does research on, uh, uh, broadly speaking, the anthropology of infrastructures, affect, consumer culture, algorithms, objects, and space. Um, she's been working on a monograph entitled Olympic Afterlives about design tactics and the reconfiguration of the public sphere and, spa and space after the Rio 2016 Olympics. We are also Alvaro uh, Harin, uh, who is an associate professor of anthropology at the College of the Holy Cross. Uh, Alvaro's research explores connections between medicine, the body, and inequality in Brazil. Among their many publications, Alvaro is the author of The Biopolitics of Beauty, Cosmetic Citizenship, and Aff Affective Capital in Brazil, which examines plastic surgery and the aesthetic hierarchies of beauty that reinforce racial inequality in Brazil. We are also Sean Mitchell, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at Rutgers University, Newark. Uh, Sean is the author of the 2017 monograph, prize-winning monograph, Constellations of Inequality, Space, Race, and Utopia in Brazil. Sean uh, writes uh, broadly about inequality politics in Brazil and elsewhere. Uh, he has a book in progress which traces the rise and fall of Brazil's early 21st century new middle class. Uh, he and I have worked together on this theme and through it, uh, the nature of the workers party governments social democratic project and emergent opposition to um, uh, the Workers' Party uh, uh, in Brazil. We are also uh, Karina Biondi, who is professor, uh, an anthropologist at the State University of Maranhão uh, in Northeastern Brazil. Uh, her research, uh, which you'll be hearing about today, focuses on prisoners, criminals, and technologies of crime control and punishment. And she is the author of uh, also a pri the prize winning Sharing This Walk, an ethnography of prison life and the PCC, which you'll hear about today in Brazil. All right, so that's who we are. We are the organizers of, um, of this project. 
Um, I want to uh, very briefly just give you a sense of how this book happened, how this volume happened. Uh, it all began roughly, uh, well, I guess when it all began is, an open, is a complicated question. But as far as uh, the organization of the book, it was mid-2018, uh, which is three years ago, more or less. And uh, at the time, I myself was on leave. I was living in Brazil in uh, the northeastern city of Recife, uh, conducting research that is part of a project with uh, Sean Mitchell, who's here today, about the so-called new middle class. Um, and these were the months leading up to the tumultuous uh, presidential elections uh, in October of 2018 that um, you'll be uh, hearing more about today. And probably most of you already know, this is when the hard right Jair Bolsonaro was elected. And I was living in Brazil uh, during the months leading up to that and um, was dialoguing um, with my colleague, Sean, and realized that um, more distant colleagues, uh, Alvaro and Lucia were also thinking along similar lines, which was we thought it would be interesting to bring together uh, a large group of anthropologists who in very different ways, working in different corners of this vast country on different issues with different populations to put together something that captured the moment leading up to the 2018 elections. Um, and we joined forces and came up with a call for proposals, which we sent out that far and wide to everyone we know in uh, early 2019. Um, and by the end of 2019, we had a nice set of, I think at that time it was about 15 or 16 papers. And uh, 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 happily, we were able to find an excellent publisher, Rutgers University Press. And in 2020, we worked with Rutgers, review what the, all of the manuscripts went through review, were revised a couple of times. We also recruited the amazing um, Brazilian uh, anthropologist historian Lilia Schwartz uh, from the University of Sao Paulo, also with an appointment at Princeton, uh, to write a, um, a kind of like a, a substantive second introduction to our book, which she graciously did. And we're very happy to have her um, as a part of this project. Um, 2021 was the year of finalizing everything and going through proofs and all of that. And, and we actually put our last tinkering, our last uh, modifications on the introduction that we wrote, the four of us wrote together uh, collectively uh, just a few months ago. Um, so we've really, it feels like, you know, this book has just come out um, and it still reflects, you know, where our heads are at, even though the world in, uh, in Brazil and beyond is changing rapidly. Okay. Uh, this, I, I realize very well that this is probably very difficult to read for most of you. Apologies for that. The, the, the point here that I want to uh, outline is um, that we have, uh, is uh, the, the organization of the book itself. Um, we have uh, 16 substantive chapters. We have two introductory uh, introductions, basically one uh, that uh, Lucia, Alvaro, Sean, and I wrote together collectively, and then we have uh, Lilia Schwartz's um, uh, introductory chapter as well. And then we have these 16 case studies, and you can, if you can read them, you can get a sense of the, the range of places and themes and populations. Um, but I, and I'm not going to introduce all of the individual chapters. I actually did prepare to do that, but there's no way I can do it in less than eight minutes, and I cannot spare eight minutes to do that. So, um, uh, but what I will say is that we have a total of 23 authors in this book, because some of the chapters have more than one author, and we're proud to um, have uh, taken seriously diversity of our authors in terms of gender, race, and nationality. Um, and I think we're uh, all especially proud to have um, just more than half of our authors are Brazilian citizens. So that was always very important to us. Um, okay, there are uh, four sections of the book. You can see them if you look at part one, part two, part three, part four. And um, they are very briefly, uh, there's a, the first section is called the intimacy of power, uh, which has four chapters that describe the gendered, classed and racialized shifts occurring within intimate spheres such as the family, um, but that also had a wider political impact because they generated intergenerational tensions and uh, 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 along those lines. Um, so that's the first set of, of chapters. The second set uh, 
is uh, in a section called Corruption and Crime. It delves into the ways in which criminality within and outside of the government came to be associated with certain moral projects and how that criminality destabilized national symbols, trust in government, and forms of reciprocity important to particular national communities. We also have the third section, which is called Infrastructures of Hope, and it's centered on forms of hopeful affect, emotion, feeling expressed by different populations uh, that once directly benefited by social welfare programs of the Workers' Party, but have become disillusioned with those programs or whose precarious situations have pushed them to hope, put their hope in Jair Bolsonaro instead. Finally, the last section is um, uh, called Old Challenges, New Activism. And it addresses forms of resistance emerging in response to the rise of far right politics across Brazil, particularly among Afro Brazilian LGBTQ plus and student activists. The last thing I'm going to do, and I think I have about four minutes left and that should be fine, is I'm going to turn off my slides. Hold on one moment. And this I'm going to um, adopt the format. Uh, the antiquated format of an old fashioned book reading. I'm gonna read you a couple little pieces from the introduction. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. Here we go. And this is meant to just give you a taste uh, of the book uh, and, and what we'll be hearing um, in a minute from our, uh, from our four presenters. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Precarious Democracy examines how Brazilians from diverse walks of life have experienced and responded to economic precarity, political crisis, and diminishing hopes for the future from 2013 to 2019. A, a pivotal period in Brazilian history, bookended by the explosion of massive protests across the country in 2013, and the first year in office of hard right President Jair Bolsonaro. As our chapters show, these were the year, these were years of of not only deepening cynicism about institutional politics, but also new forms of hope and resistance with transformative promise for the future. Um, hence the title of the book that includes both cynicism, you know, and kind of uh, despair, but also hope and resistance, okay? All right, um, now I'm gonna read you uh, a little bit more. So um, we put the finishing touches on this, in, in, this introduction in uh, just a few months ago. And at that moment, Brazil, as we wrote, uh, was and is in the grips of the devastating COVID-19 pandemic. And as we wrote then, it's difficult to find words to depict, let alone account for the extraordinary transformations to Brazil's political, economic, and affective landscapes that characterized the past decade. Even before the virus emerged and began ravaging Brazil, those transformations were devastatingly manifest. Around 2010, just a decade ago, Brazil seemed poised to become a global economic and political power, and the country was hailed worldwide as an example of successful progressive governance. During the two-term two presidency of Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, or Lula, uh, of the Leftist Workers' Party or the PT from, 20, uh, from 2003 to 2010, some 30 million people uh, exited poverty as poor and working classes saw an enormous expansion of opportunities for educational, economic, and geographic mobility. When Lula completed his second term in office in 2010, he had an 87% approval rating and was widely credited for having steered the country around the global economic crisis. On these laurels, many pundits assumed that the next decade, the decade we're just finishing up now, would bring continued reduction of poverty and inequality and a deepening of progressive governance to this brutally unequal nation. And indeed, overall economic trends characterizing the Lula years continued during the first term of Lula's PT successor, Dilma Rousseff. Just a little bit more. Uh, okay. More than a decade after the optimism of, of 2009, Brazil looks radically different. 
Uh, even before the COVID pandemic, many of the social gains of the previous decade had been dismantled. Brazil's economy had sunk to ninth, ninth place globally in terms of GDP, gross domestic product, and a lot of people, millions of people had fallen back below the, the poverty line. Moreover, in 2019, Brazil became the, the democratic country with the world's highest concentration of income among the top 1%. Um, and few now view Brazil as a formidable emerging international power, despite its planetary environmental significance. Uh, as many of you know, probably uh, between April uh, 2018 and November 2019, Lula himself was imprisoned under politically motivated charges to remove him from running in the presidential election for which he was leading the polls. Um, and crucially, crucially, uh, riven by violent political polarization, Brazil has seen the rise of a vast far right movement capable of marshalling massive political and electoral support. Somewhat paradoxically, even among those populations who most benefited under the PT governments. So I'm gonna wrap up, I'm gonna wind, uh, wind down uh, with a, just a little bit about the, vo the volume and what, uh, what comes next. It's hard for us to see what the future holds uh, for Brazil, but this volume, Precarious Democracy, attempts to understand crucial transitional years for the nation and add ethnographic depth to our understanding of the major shifts that Brazil has undergone during this period. With democracy itself rendered precarious, grand narratives to describe these radical national shifts seem to fail. Any claim made about the present is likely, uh, is like an attempt to hold steady a constantly changing object, making academic analysis feel, at least to us, impossible. But by paying close ethnographic attention to how different communities in Brazil lived through the country's momentous transformations of the past decade, this book attempts to account for the multiplicity of experiences that have structured the current moment. One of the most powerful attributes of ethnography uh, is its ability to show us how different people engage in meaning making during crises and social transformations and can experience the same event differently according to perspective, whether that perspective is shaped by race, gender, class, region, or any of the other vertices uh, along uh, with the social experiences, harms and benefits that may be distributed. Uh, in our, and now I'm, I'm actually uh, paraphrasing and then I'll, I'll stop um, and say that in this book, we do not attempt uh, to arrive at a singular explanation for what has happened in Brazil during the past year. Um, where that is not our project um, to, to answer a, a specific question about Bolsonaro's election, for example. Um, uh, we do not seek to provide uh, definite answers to how and why Brazil shifted as it did, although we developed several hypotheses within the pages of the book, nor do we claim we can predict what the future holds. Rather, through a close examination of the experiences, narratives, affects, and actions of people from many perspectives who lived through this period of unexpected sociopolitical change, Precarious democracy aspires to be an enduring account of life under conditions of political and economic precarity and unpredictable political change. So having said that, um, I'm done and we are ready to move on. And I believe that Karina, you are uh, first. So it's a pleasure to introduce Karina Biondi and um, let's do it. Thank you, man. And thank you for this uh, uh, this, this lounge, a uh, virtual lounge. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, I will read my my, uh, my presentation uh, in order to uh, not extend uh, a long uh, a longer way. Uh, uh, um, after the time I, I had, I, I, sorry for my my bad English. Uh, uh, but I, I, I hope you can understand what I'm saying. Um, yeah, let's go. My capture, um, the, the, the title of my capture was uh, the effects of some religious affects, uh, re revolutions in crime. Um, for more than 10 years, 
I researched the first command of, cap of the capital, the PCC, uh, a group that appeared inside the prisons in the early 90s, and today has become a geno uh, an agenomic uh, uh, force, both in prison and in poor peripheral neighborhood in the state of Sao Paulo, Brazil. Today, uh, it's in another countries and other states of Brazil too, but uh, uh, my focus is on in, in Sao Paulo. Uh, in uh, 2000, 2015, I started a new research project in a Brazilian prison, and my weekly uh, meetings with the prisoners took place uh, then uh, at the institution's library, with the presence of at least three of them and permission for others to circulate, to circulate there. One day, when we, are, uh, we were talking about literary preferences, a uh, prisoner uh, who was a member of the PCC told me that all he read in prison were Pastor Silas Malafaia's books. I was surprised because Pastor Malafaia, uh, besides being one of the leaders of the Assemblies, uh, Assemblies of God in Brazil, is well known for his ultra-conservative stance and his political influence. Uh, Malafaia was one of the main supporters of Bolsonaro. In his campaign, com campaign uh, Bolsonaro professed the same conservative values defended by Malafaia for years. Some of those values mix, mixed uh, religious and moral issues uh, with public security. Adopting the notion that bandido bom é bandido morto, or uh, the only good criminal is the dead criminal, supported by Malafaia and other religious people, Bolsonaro defended the projects that introduced the death penalty in Brazil. This contradiction between Malafaia's discourse and the prisoner's very existence caught my attention, and I asked myself how a prisoner could for uh, uh, appreciate Malafaia's readings. Um, furthermore, uh, while PCC claims to have worked a revolution in prisons and good neighborhood in the state of Sao Paulo, how could people who view themselves as uh, revolutionaries against what they call uh, state oppression agree with that discourse? The same evangelical orientations uh, that supported the argument for Bolsonaro as president have also been circulating uh, for many years in the prisons and in the poor neighborhoods where I conducted my, my research. Evangelical religions have a larger presence inside the prisons, not only because religious uh, services are held every week, every week, uh, by evangelical preachers inside the prisons unit, but uh, also because their discourses and guide guidelines are those that manifest the most of uh, in inmates' behaviors. B biblical quotations, uh, Christian references, and moral reason based on religious teachings can be found in a diffuse for for, uh, form in the discourses of the inmates in PCC prisons. On the other hand, it's common for evangelical denominations to use the language of the prisoners, uh, of the prisoners, biblical uh, texts uh, mentioning the prison experience of Jesus and some of his apostles uh, are constantly read by evangelical preachers. Jail is present as a test that. Uh, 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 jail is presented as a test that the prisoner is sub subjected to, uh, which should be endured with courage. Although they say, uh, whoever doesn't come uh, to God through love comes to him through pain. Uh, they all said, uh, go, uh, God does, uh, does not like weaklings or, and cowards. He likes fires, fighters. Even when uh, he was uh, imprisoned and tortured to recognize Caesar's uh, reign, 
uh, Jesus went on saying that his king was the king of kings. The experience of Jesus was uh, uh, um, um, underlined uh, to, to, uh, to, 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 to do this, this connection. These uh, statements, uh, among the others, uh, serve as an encouragement for the prisoner to see his prison sentence as a stage he must go through uh, without bowing before the oppressor. It produces a sentiment of determination um, to fight and resist. Inmates appreciate this kind of resistance against the established order, uh, which helps solve the contradictions implied in the use of violence as a means uh, to, to achieve peace. Biblical statements are used as cries for, of resistance, resistance, especially when God is envisaged as the one and only judge, the one being who is truly just, fair, and capable of meeting out true, true justice, the divine truth, justice. In this context, crime is understood as a sin like any other. All sins are put on an equal footing. Thus, homicide, uh, adultery, and blasphemy are seen as equally severed for all of them trespass against Christian, pre, uh, Christian principles. That is, all can be pardon, pardoned by God, who is understanding and merciful. This idea enables, enables uh, the criminal to perceive himself as a sinner like any other capable of being pardoned by God in spite of the verdict imposed by the justice of men. In the same way in which the quest for peace among prisoners is promoted by religious formulas, uh, these formulas uh, also play a role in reinforcing confrontation against do, who, those who smith out the justice of men, policemen, prison agents, uh, judges, pre prosecutors, police deputies, characterized as imperfect and inaccurate when compared with divine justice. More than that, this triggers a sentiment of willingness uh, among the prisoners to face the pressure, motivating them to do uh, the revolution, in this case, through the PCC. After all, this formation is a way of getting, uh, getting prisoners together and offering them the shelter and the backing they need to confront the state. The mixture, mixture of biblical formulas and prison slang found inside uh, uh, jails has spread through, throughout the poor neighborhoods. Uh, it's on the lips uh, of uh, old people, children, workers, and uh, other people who often have nothing to do with crime or with the church. Everybody's talking about Jesus or biblical forms, uh, formulas. Uh, biblical formulas uh, with an evangelical Islam uh, are even more present in everyday talk and not only in favelas or prisons, although they, uh, they are still strong in these spaces. Upon hearing uh, the God of war, uh, of, no, the word of God, uh, upon hearing the, the, the word of God, people say they feel comfort, peace, self-esteem, and freedom. Furthermore, uh, it's not just the prisoners who feel courage and determination to face their enemies when they hear religious speeches. Although the, the, the feelings are the same for a fair share of the Brazilian population, the affective engagement, the enemies and the revolution in play are different. And here we come to the point highlighted by Gabriel Feltran, uh, 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 sociology, uh, sociology uh, teacher in Brazil. Uh, what prevails in Brazil is not an authori uh, authoritarian state, but a mass movement that motivated by religious discourse, fights for moral and cultural hegemony um, within the framework of the Old Testament. For those who participate in this movement, fighting 
fighting is the only way to save the world from the forces of evil, their greatest, greatest uh, fear. Uh, with the engagement of rightist political movements, the feelings incited by uh, religious speech were uh, inter uh, intertwined uh, with the idea of a cultural and moral project for Brazil and gained, uh, gained uh, another vehicles uh, for dissemination. Mais um minuto, Karina. Okay. Uh, the word of God in this scheme gains, gains more uh, speech and great, greater reach, uh, reaching a, a larger number of people, but, but also spreading uh, and inter intertwining with a greater number of subjects issues and discursive repertoires. Questions about uh, religion, sexuality, politics, economics, uh, education, and security uh, are all blended in the same formulation in a mass movement. Their aim, aim is a social uh, transformation that Bolsonaro and his supporters call a, a revolution. Uh, and, and on one side, the revolution of the crime, and the, and the other side, the revolution uh, of Bolso the Bolsonaro's uh, revolution. Um, well, uh, at, uh, if at the, the, the first sign that seems to indicate a confrontation between two opposite uh, ethics, what uh, chinography reveals uh, is bo uh, both those. Uh, Ethics share is that the book the Zohar ethics share the same religious discourse, and the consequent coexistence of this discourse with different ethics, producing different sentiments and outputs in each one. The same religious orientation that supported the Bolsonaro's revolution uh, has also supported the revolution against the oppression of the police states in the prison and in the favelas where I conducted my research. The effects of uh, evangelical speech vary uh, a lot. Religious discourse is able to trigger to, uh, different feelings, including encouragement and the determination to fight in different formation, mix it uh, with different elements. Uh, these statements are capable uh, of producing different effects that in the end can result in different attitudes, orientation, thoughts, and votes. And thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, uh, Karina. All right, and next is uh, uh, is Lucia Cantero, and onwards. Lucia, you are muted. It seems. Can everyone see my screen? Yes, now we can. Thank you, wonderful. Let me take a moment to thank everyone that made today possible, um, but I'll get right into it. Um, I'm gonna begin with a vignette that didn't make its way to the chapter and kind of talk a bit about a why, why that shaped some of the questions I think this chapter reveals. <clears throat> I walked along Rua Pedro Americo in older Catechi district on a humid day in January, 2010 and paused at a confeteria for suco de laranja y pastel. I sensed a public spectacle behind me and following the cashier's gaze, I turned to hear an enthused voice belting, black earth yields good bread. Black earth yields good bread. In Portuguese, of course, that terra negra da bom pão. Terra negra da bom pão. Tucked behind a caravan of vendors and their brightly colored carts on the ground near a plot of grass, wedged by Portuguese pebbles, I saw a man digging into the earth, moaning delightedly, que delicia, he chuckled, as he tore a piece of bread, dipped it into the llama, the black earth, and bit ferociously, licking his lips in savory approval. Given the mix of pity and banality on the employees' faces, this performance was for certain an encore. In this quotidian scene, the patrons of the corner bakery witnessed the reenactment of the old idiom, speaking poignant metaphors metaphorical truths about consumption in Brazil today. The connection reached a height where after a bout of intensive digging activity, moreover, earned him a new moniker, Zé Petrobras. 
This act of nicknaming, though seen as a humorous gesture that charges new meaning into old signs, also indexes the way in which oil or uh, Petrobras orders cultural logics. This kind of speaking truth to power, and even in the face, even in this kind of madness, um, in the face of shifting political economies, I think gives us clues about how to interpret excess, decay, filth as alternative forms of resistance that, that uh, defy the conventional reading of neoliberal order, or rather rewrite instrumental rationality writ into capitalism as effective. These, uh, these kinds of events beg anthropologists to think about everyday forms of social and political commentary as a form of cultural logic that can rework older significations of the commodity form, a kind of poetic engagement um, with commodities and propaganda that highlights subjects roles as citizens and consumers. So this short vignette, like I mentioned, is not in the chapter, but it is what inspired it. And indeed, one of the central thrusts in this edited volume grapples with this relationship between affect and politics, as you'll read in our intro. More specifically, in this chapter, I'm occupied with how subjects form relationships to commodities as both consumers and citizens. And the vicissitude of the, so of the social life of Petrobras in Brazil seemed like an apt way to examine this process. I'm having trouble with my slides. Okay. Petrobras was once the apogee of Brazilian pride. At the height of the Workers' Party leadership and commodity boom, Petrobras went public on September 24th, 2010, with a valuation that then President Lula exalted as, quote, the highest in the history of capitalism. It was undeniably a euphoric moment. Petrobras had become the largest company in Latin America with market capitalization and revenues outshining all others. What, on days before Dilma was to be elected in 2010, Lula graced the Bosfa Stock Exchange in Sao Paulo, along with his team to address the heads of Brazilian banks, politicians, citizens of the nation and beyond. And this is the image. Uh, wearing a white hard hat and neon orange jacket, he reminded the public of a sovereignty that Petrobras had recently made possible with the discovery of pre -salt. This in the backdrop of the 28 global economic crisis, which had spared Brazil, seemed to make Lula even more ecstatic. He asserted that unlike the past, Petrobras achieved what it could no, never do before, capitalize on the future modes of productivity over time and reconcile all worries that it would debilitate the state or alienate the public patrimony. He declared, quote, Brazil is very proud of Brazil. What is materializing here today is a decision of a sovereign society to capitalize their future, to capitalize the future modes of productivity for the present and for generations to come. Petrobras is an extraordinary triumph for Brazil's development, end quote. The national ceremony adjourned in characteristically festive form and like a sports team, the president and his council huddled together like this image shows, pressing a button that released metallic confetti and sounded the very same sonic Brazil heard when a goal is scored. This moment marked an exemplary time in 2010 when Petrobras rocked the financial records as the most profitable valuation project ever, successfully capitalizing the highest pro uh, profit going public to foreign share shareholders in economic history at the time. Today, Petroleo Brasileiro is a semi-public majority owned state Majority state-owned company occupied mostly with oil and gas exploration, refining, and transport. It is nominally Brazil's largest company. Headquartered in downtown Rio, Petrobras history is charged. Stories of blood absorbed in a national struggle to defend the, quote, riches of the land, as my interlocutors described, um, as sovereignty as well. An effective connection to this company that I think first was enunciated in the 1949 slogan, U petróleo es nuestro, hereafter the oil is ours, ebbs and flows with changing moments that reflect deep, deep structures of feelings and consciousness. From the euphoria of the pre-salt discovery and its valuation project at Bosfa, and more recently, the public outcry, shame and vitriol, which ultimately targeted the Workers' Party and the very foundational, the very political foundation on which it stood. This crude sovereignty that Lula invoked turned rather quickly from dis, uh, euphoria to dystopia, or as this edited volume conveys, from hope to despair in governments as the associated Petroleos corruption scandal emerged and shook Brazilians and the very meaning of democracy. 
The Lava Jato task force was deployed to investigate the details of the graft, revealing a, a mammoth bribery scheme that exposed countless connections to Petrobras and huge swaths of Brazilian politicians. It dominated mainstream media and the juridical politics around these conditions led to the impeachment, also understood by many as a soft coup of Dilma and landed ex-president Lula in prison. Vice President Temer stepped in as acting president after Dilma was impeached and then became president on August 31st. It was against this backdrop that extreme right uh, candidate Bolsonaro was elected in 2018. Now the chapter that I'm, that I'm calling from begins with this euphoric valuation to convey the ways that Petrobras reflects not only how Brazilians forge nationalism and notions of sovereignty, but also how this imbrication hinges on effective attachments that co-produce political subjectivity. In other words, I demonstrate how Petrobras served as a charged symbol of a nation, its cultural politics, and Brazil's relationship to globalization, or even post. I explore the effective attachments and contestations that emerge around three distinct moments in Petrobras' history and enduring social life. One, the inaugural and foundational push under then President Getulio Vargas to stay public or state-owned. The aforementioned moment of capitalization under Lula in 2010 or going public. And in 2014, the Petroleo scan, uh, corruption scandal exposed by Lava Jato. The first section of the chapter explores that history, and I'm not going to get too, too deep into that. Um, but I was particularly interested with the uh, effervescent disenchantment around corruption and increasingly privatizing state resources before the scandal. And this ethnographic data was called from interlocutors who responded to queries and surveys around Petrobras propaganda and memory pooled in 2011. Um, what I learned speaking to people on the ground is that they had a lot to say about this sort of uh, older kind of more romantic moment in Petrobras history. Uh, uh, Evelyn, a young lawyer from Catechi I interviewed was also an intern at the oil industry workers union, Sin Pedro, and, recount and recounted the salience of the slogan. She recalled, I remember the culture of not letting our rich nat national resources and the technology that we patent get sold. And there is uh, kind of a quick look at the inaugural campaign under Vargas. Now, these were known as the anti sellouts. Um, one minute he, left, uh, Lucia. I'm sorry? Uh, one minute, your one minute warning. Okay. Um, so I learned a lot just from talking to people about these sorts of things, but the Petroleo scandal, uh, corruption scandal, exposed these. Uh, sorry. I didn't realize it was one. Not only did these scandals uh, rupture the existing social and political order, but they also conflated forms of dissent. And what we learn is that uh, <clears throat> lawfare, I'm sorry, I think the one minute uh, notification threw me a bit off. Okay, so in the landscape of law of the global lawfare that came with the Petroleo scandal, I, f I argue that normative media in Brazil amplified the scandals by weaponizing politics as, skeptic uh, as spectacle, right? Um, I, I, I ask why did Sergio Moro become a, a, such a, fi a, a figure of a sort of figure, a Batman figure of order? And it was because in the last, in the years that preceded that, the there had been an increasing, in, uh, 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 excuse me, um, autonomization of the judiciary. So I, I, the slow and gradual internationalization of the Ministry of, of Justice made, uh, a com with accompanying technocratic production, made that kind of um, scandalization, I argue, uh, possible, Let's see. Of these juridical innovations, the coupling of the anti-corruption laws with the introduction of plea bargains created these conditions. And within this context of global lawfare, the casualties of these new forms of power are clear. As, as Lava Jato took down corruption, it also stripped Petrobras of the crude sovereignty it once declared. After years of being the very bedrock of developmental nationalism, a solid symbol and reflection of the Brazilian state, the very inaugural moment in this chapter I mentioned when Petrobras launched its IPO um, leaves the residues of perhaps the quietest of corruption consequences and, it, and yet easily the most excessive. Indeed, what I, I think is lost from this narrative that I think is important is the transnational layer made possible by the reconfiguration of the international political economy and the ways that Petrobras promiscuous connection to big companies like Odebrecht 
are endemic to a neoliberal globalization that makes or marks rather a particular habitus in the history and social life of Brazil. Indeed, Petrobras has in these years since the soft coup gone from 40% parapetrol that were national to over 72% owned by Halle Burton. Taken together, my interlocutors in 2011 were prophetic themselves when they suggested the oil was sold long ago. As I've conveyed throughout this, as I convey throughout this chapter, the effective attachments and symbolics around Petrobras shifted tremendously. Under global civil society and governance, NGOs like Transparency International enacted a vertical topography of power that operationalized innovations and jurisprudence that supported Sergio Moro and, um, and, and obscured the extractive nature of the Petrobras corruption, which ultimately paid $3 billion in fines to the US Department of Justice under Foreign Corruption Practices Act of 1977. Indeed, this is one of the largest security fraud settlements after Enron. To this day, Petrobras obviously denies the accuracy of these wrongdoings, but still had to pay out, revealing a deeper layer in this example of anti-corruption politics that, only re that not only reifies the US fiscal and hegemonic dominance, but also begs the question of whom these corruption scandals ultimately benefited. Indeed, it reveals a lawfare and legal extraction via fines can accompany the shaming of the global South using corruption as imperial practices of capital accumulation. And I'll stop there, but I hope that's a quick overview of the chapter. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Lucia. Uh, onwards to Alvaro, you're on. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll share my screen as well. So uh, in comparison to Lucia's and Karina's work, which was just much more depressing, right? Sort of. Um, as important as, as those two chapters are. Um, my chapter tries to figure out, and the section of uh, the book that I'm part of tries to figure out from the resistance, right? So how are people organizing against Bolsonaro? How are people um, reacting to his election? So uh, my specific focus is on gender non-conforming activism in Brazil. Uh, by Jade Bolsonaro, as you probably are all aware, uh, use homophobia and transphobia uh, as a central aspect for his rise, right? Uh, for nearly a decade, Bolsonaro claimed that LGBT educational materials were quote unquote, incentivizing homosexualism and promiscuity. And according to him, made children easy targets for pedophiles. Um, his focus on what he called the dangers of um, uh, gender ideology, which has become a sort of rallying cry, just like critical race theory is a rallying cry today in the United States. Uh, by conservatives, right? It's sort of like the kids are being taught these wrongful things that are teaching them to be trans or to be gay, right? As if you could teach those things. Uh, and this is an activity of parents ahead into the global spouting those things and being not challenged very strongly by the media. Uh, uh, in addition to his sort of false information, uh, Brazilian social media spread up fake news that we now know were partly funded by um, allies of Bolsonaro that also spread sort of misinformation. For example, one you know, widespread news was that the PT, the Workers' Party, was using erotic baby bottles in, um, in kindergartens to sort of seduce children into becoming gay. There was another fake news that circulated widely before the election that said that Pablo Vittar, a famous drag queen, would be on the 50 highs bill. So what I'm interested here is in what I call the politics of disgust, right? Bolsonaro used this politics of disgust to portray LGBT minorities as a threat to the nation, right? In order to win the election in very similar ways to how Trump used Mexicans, right? Crossing the border in the same way. Um, it targeted viewers on a visceral, non-rational level, right? Through these misinformation campaigns. Um, and Sien and Guy, uh, who's an affect theorist, argues that disgust has always been central to the political right as a means to reinforce boundaries between self uh, and quote unquote contaminating others, right? So we can see that sort of right wing propaganda across the world has done this over and over again. Uh, so when gender nonconforming activists in Sao Paulo realized that this was a battle that was not happening in sort of logic, right? You can't just, you can't really convince people to sort of let go of misinformation that easily when they're sort of effectively invested in it. They realized they have to fight emotion with emotion. Right? And so a lot of them use African emotion in their political responses, 
pushing Brazilian audiences to rewire their feelings towards discriminated minorities as opposed to rewiring sort of their knowledge about it, right, simply. Uh, Sarah Matt calls this sort of, she says like, when you had discussed it towards an other, there's nonetheless a moment of possibility where the disgust comes from being in contact with an other. And there's always the possibility that you can actually uh, enact change. Uh, so the way that gender affirming activists do this is through theater, fashion, music, uh, spoken word. There's almost no form of art that they don't engage in. Uh, just to give you a few examples in this short talk, uh, I saw this amazing play called Las Tres de Sao Paulo City, which was written and, and the two main actresses were trans actresses as well, but the, the, the script the screenwriter as well was trans. Um, and it was this amazing play that remembered transphobic violence during the dictatorship police violence in particular, and it helped the audience rethink the politics of disgust, right, by humanizing travesty lives, first of all, right, presenting them as full human beings, but also by recruiting uh, the audience as protesters. So there's this amazing moment in the play where they ask people to get off their seats, and it's voluntary, not everybody does it, and you can go on the stage and pick up placards and protest against travesty people that are uh, sort of imprisoned, right? Or see women that are imprisoned. And it's this amazing way to try to get the audience not just to rethink how they feel about the whole thing, but to actually engage in activism and sort of then hopefully learn how to do it on the street, right? If they are not already engaged in this. Uh, the play uh, sort of very openly called for a feminist revolution um, and was very much invested in creating a different future, right? So it wasn't just simply a play that looked at the past, but was sort of saying like, we're living through this again and we need to think of a different future for travesty um, and gender non-conforming people in general. Another thing that travesty and trans activists do is they reclaim Christian symbols, right? So for example, Viviane Veleboni famously crucified herself uh, during a Sao Paulo pride parade to denounce homophobia and transphobia. And Renata Carvalho created uh, an amazing play called uh, The Gospel uh, According to the Queen of Heaven, Jesus Christ which reimagines Jesus coming back, the second coming of Jesus Christ, coming back as a travesty. And it's a fantastic play that, again, is super emotional. And of course, there were like major protests against it. But Renata de Carvalho maintains that at the end of the day, she had very productive dialogue with pastors, Christian, Christian pastors, that began to rethink uh, their prejudice based on this play. Uh, they're also incredibly savvy about using social media to do activism. So Linda Quebrada on the left, who's a very famous musician, uh, for example, uh, has posted on Instagram various images of herself as Jesus Christ. Uh, and on the right, we have an image from the Instituto Brasileiro de Transmasculinidade, so the Transmasculine uh, Brazilian Institute, that also creates these visibility campaigns. And I particularly like this image because it's for the day of trans visibility. And it says, there isn't any polemic, we just want to be happy. And it's very interesting that it's a, an image where it shows, it doesn't try to hide sort of the uh, kind of surgery that a trans man would undergo, but actually kind of showcases it and says sort of it's in your face, but at the same time, it was accompanied by this beautiful text that talked about changing the way you feel about trans men and saying, if you don't love them, you know, it leads to higher suicide rates. So it, it was interesting how it, between the text and the image, it was, became a very powerful symbol. Uh, music uh, is sort of huge. So Linda Quebrada is one of them today, one of the most famous musicians, not just in Sao Paulo, but in Brazil. Uh, she even has an international audience. Um, and, and her music has always been very much about celebrating travesty lives and critiquing transphobia and critiquing sort of uh, the, the cisgender system, right? So on the right, for example, you have uh, short lyrics from her song, Blasphemia, Blasphem, that sort of plays with that idea of blasphemy. Um, and I love, for example, uh, she talks about how the travesty is the prima donna of the gutters and her body's an occupation. She's a slum, garage, sewer, and to your disgust, she's always in deconstruction. I applaud the travestis who struggle to exist, and every day they conquer the right to live and shine. And the music video, if you look at it, I highly recommend it, um, uh, Mulier or Blasphemia, on, um, it's incredibly powerful, and it sort of taught, it rewrites the idea of a woman, a travesty woman getting attacked uh, for doing sex work in the street and sort of turns it around on, 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 on the men that are doing the violence. 
Um, the music video for Diabla on the left does a very similar thing, right? Where she sort of, uh, men are trying to attack her and they end up attacking each other because she seems to be supernatural. Uh, and the lyrics are also really interesting, right? Your law made me illegal. They call me dirty, crazy, and immoral. They will have to swallow me willingly or unwillingly now that I have achieved global standing. I don't ask for approval. Your permission never made a difference without meaning to be rude. Fuck your beliefs, right? So it's sort of a very direct response to how the Christian right is sort of demonizing LGBT people, particularly trans women uh, and travestis, and really changing that around. One minute warning, sorry, Alvaro. That's fine. Um, so just to end, I want to end with uh, when when Bolsonaro got elected, right? A lot of people sort of just entered into despair because they put so much energy into trying to stop him from getting elected. But I really liked what Linda Quebrada had to say in an Instagram uh, post. Uh, she said, now is not the moment to be fearful, much less to retreat. They are the ones who are fearful in the face of all victories and advances. I would also be afraid if I were in their place. And that is why I cannot let go of all that we have achieved until now. And I ask that you join me in this battle. Now is the moment to join together, to sharpen our dialogue, to have our voices echo, to make our bodies present, to build and elaborate new strategies, to build intersectional politics, understanding our common demands. Um, so it's really fascinating to me how invested uh, travesti and trans activists in Brazil are in intersectionality and thinking through issues of class inequality and racial inequality and gender and, and inequality and transphobia together. Um, and you have amazing uh, people being elected, like Erika Hilton, Erika Malunguini in Sao Paulo, to powerful positions of, pow of power and really trying to change the system from within politics. At the same time, they have these artists that are doing it outside. Um, so again, just a quick summary of what my chapter is about, um, and I'd be happy to answer more, give more details in the question and answer period. Uh, our final uh, presentation comes from Sean Mitchell. Sean, you're on. All right, thank you, Ben, and thank you, everyone. Um, hi, everybody, it's great to be here. Um, and I'm just gonna briefly present uh, some, some context for and a bit of the content of my chapter, Cruel Pessimism, the Affect of Anti-Corruption and the End of the New Brazilian Middle Class. Um, between 2015 and uh, the present, really, but, uh, 2018, I have not been to Brazil, unfortunately, since 2018, um, I attempted to conduct ethnographic research on a, a disappearing um, or, you know, perhaps, according to some, never existing object, and that was uh, Brazil's so-called new middle class. And uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, I uh, conducted that project together with him and with, with Charles Klein. Um, we, you know, start, I think Ben and I started talking about this in like 2013, uh, that we were both thinking about, you know, this, this emerging uh, apparent class of people, um, you know, according to some reckonings, something like 40 million people um, who had risen above the poverty line into this new class. Um, and, you know, this is something under capitalism, reduction of inequality, as, as Piketty uh, has shown, is, is something historically rare. Right, so this is, uh, you know, this incredible moment of, of poverty reduction, of, of inequality reduction in um, this massively unequal society. Um, and we managed to get funding uh, to finally to start at the very end of 2015, really in, in 2016, um, just at the moment when uh, this was absolutely crumbling. And so what began uh, to, you know, as a project to kind of study the implications of something that you know, it was kind of really wonderful, this, this optimistic moment of, of massive poverty reduction, um, unfortunately, was a, a chronicle of decline. Um, and, you know, that is what much of this edited volume charts. Um, and, you know, I, I could spend a lot of time talking about this, I'm gonna have to be uh, quick skipping through things. Uh, but but just, you know, the decline is, is so precipitous. And, uh, you know, in, in 2013, um, Brazil famously um, was taken off the United Nations map of hunger, um, um, you know, with uh, just over 3% supposedly then facing actual hunger and you know, some 22% facing food insecurity, which is, you know, still a lot. Um, but, you know, in Brazil, this is a big deal. T today, according to a recent study, uh, about 9% of the Brazilian population are, you know, in a real state of hunger. It's some 20 million people. 
uh, and more than half of the population are facing food insecurity. So the, the extent of the material decline uh, is, is just um, horrific. Um, and uh, again, uh, this, this project kind of began optimistically. Um, and you'll notice, I mean, here I'm, I'm already, uh, you know, becoming kind of affected in, in thinking about this. And a lot of the chapters in this book focus on affect and uh, to use Raymond Williams' famous term, it's structures of feeling, right? Taking this idea that structures or feeling are, are not something really personal, but it's something that, you know, are social and historical that can be investigated as these historical objects and ethnographic objects. Um, and this paper that I may or may not actually get to in my short 10 minutes um, is actually the first paper I've ever written that really focuses on affect. But it's noticeable that when we put out a call for chapters in this volume a few years ago uh, on ethnographies that could address this uh, period of, of democratic precarity and transition in Brazil, we got a lot of people trying to cope with these affective dimensions. So there's something that a lot of anthropologists were picking up on. And as you'll see, a lot of the, the chapters you've heard about today uh, address uh, affect and this, this, you know, uh, although uh, thank you Alvaro for bringing some optimism um, in this, this move from kind of something, you know, in a mass, a mass kind of optimism to something closer to its opposite. Um, so uh, I, I should say another thing that is important to this chapter and important about those years, and Lucia's already touched on this, these years that I, uh, with my colleagues, was able to conduct this research were also the years of Lava Jato, the ostensible anti-corruption investigation, uh, which as you know, very abundant leaked social media or telegram transcripts have now made absolutely clear, uh, worked politically to defeat the electoral left through a kind of lawfare, um, you know, including the impeachment of, of Gilma and the arrest of 2018 presidential front runner, really without evidence, uh, but his arrest, it's now been uh, reversed of, of Lula, which paved the way for Bolsonaro. That's a story I won't get into. Although I should say there's, there's one important aspect of that story, uh, which does not really get covered in the scholarship that much yet, um, uh, which is that, you know, Lava Jato was, was heralded in Brazilian and foreign press as this heroic thing. Um, even when it was clear that there were, you know, numerous illegalities. It's also the case that those transcripts have revealed substantial uh, involvement of the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI in that process. And, you know, I think the full extent of foreign involvement in the undermining of Brazilian democracy has not yet been given sufficient scholarly attention, uh, though there are many journalists who have worked on it. Um, but that's all context. I'd be happy to discuss that stuff in the question and answers if you want to. Um, I'll, I'll get though to the argument which uh, that I make in the chapter, which is again, it's ethnographically based, based on my research, uh, principally in the north, in the north zone of Rio de Janeiro in this project, um, and and you know it, it involves this larger context. And I'll, I'll read a bit from the chapter. Uh, Lauren Berlant has influentially described a form of affect prevalent under neoliberalism in the United States, cruel optimism, the affect of a failed American dream. Berlant discusses cruel optimism as the imperative to strive for goals that are unreachable, uh, which leads people to accept hopes, plans, and behaviors that are harmful to their well being. Uh, a relation of cruel optimism, Berlant writes, exists when something you desire is actu actually an obstacle to your flourishing. Um, and I use a, a phrase kind of drawing on Berlant that I, I take from Dia da Costa, uh, uh, cruel pessimism. And as I use it in the chapter, cruel pessimism is not quite, I mean, it's, it's close to what Berlant describes. And I found Berlant's work really helpful here in thinking through the, these you know, kinds of structures of feeling that I encountered and uh, studying people among this, you know, these previously poor people in Brazil. But as I use it in the chapter, cruel pessimism rather than cruel optimism is not quite this imperative to strive for the impossible and self-defeating that Berlant describes, but rather the sense that all forms of collective striving for public good are doomed to failure because of the deficiencies and corruption of the would-be strivers themselves. So I argue in the chapter that three interlocking factors have cultivated a cruel pessimism uh, among Brazil's previously ascendant, right? was previously poor. And those factors are one, dashed hopes of social mobility, two, uh, a growing and developing awareness of the hypocrisy of anti-corruption 
in, in which many of these people once had some kind of faith, um, which uh, compounded longstanding awareness of the banality of corruption itself, and three, uh, pervasive and hypervisible injustice and structural inequality. Um, and that these things have kind of combined uh, to produce this, this uh, cruel pessimism, which, which ends up kind of being this um, self-reinforcing affective dynamic for, for reasons I go into in the chapter. Uh, the chapter focuses on the ethnography that informs this argument, um, but I, I wanna make it as clear as possible uh, in this short amount of time, hopefully enticing some of you to read the book, to read the chapter. Um, uh, and I'll abstract some of the, the ethnography in a kind of ideal type form. So in recent years, my interlocutors in urban working class Brazil would frequently lament the end of social mobility, the poverty of public services, and the untrustworthiness of political leaders. The most common explanations that my interlocutors gave for these things was some version of, again, I'm uh, kind of creating an ideal type here, um, some version of that you know, we have these problems because we Brazilians are corrupt and thus collective projects are doomed to fail. Um, this is what I'm referring to as cruel pessimism, a consequence of the three factors that I, I mentioned above. And I think it was one important condition of possibility for Brazil's swing to the far right at um, the end of, uh, the previous decade. And in the chapter, I map out the characteristics of, of cruel pessimism using ethnographic examples. And I reflect on the profound implications of this affective formation for Brazilian politics. One minute, Sean. One minute. You know, then maybe uh, because there's no way for me to get into the rest of the material with one minute, I think I kind of gave you all a basic sense of the argument. Um, and uh, you know, please do read the chapter or reach out to me if you want to talk about it. And I look forward to the discussion. Thanks all for being here.